哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒。呀哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒哒。Ah, welcome to our very first episode of Mantelpiece Theater. We're so glad that you could join us. And we feel that we have something really special for you today in this our premier installment. If all goes well, we hope that there will be many more episodes in the future for you to enjoy. So take a moment now to relax, pour yourself a drink, and kick off your shoes. The protagonist in today's story is a remarkable German tree frog, and his journey sheds light on a little-known fact of history. The severe potato bug famine of southern Germany in the late 1900s, which displaced thousands of German tree frogs, the potato bug famine affected not only potato bugs but also flies, and many other sources of nourishment for the German tree frogs. So they fled to other lands in search of food. Some settled in America, many in the region of southern Pennsylvania. Our story takes place in the present. Several decades after the potato bug famine, when the main character also immigrates to the United States from his native Germany, and he has a harrowing adventure. Now that you are settled in and ready to hear our tale, we do hope that you are entertained, and we also hope that you learn a little bit about tree frogs as well. And now, without any further delay, on to the story. The Frog with a Frog in His Throat, a short story by Francis Spillane. And now a brief break, much needed. A little-known tale about an ordinary tree frog, with an extraordinary moniker, and a highly unusual, and somewhat ironic malady. His name is Theodore. Well, when time permits. Theodore Ribbitz, Kronprinz und Kaiser Bergkraft von Waldschloss. Teddy, as his lazy friends like to call him, moved unexpectedly to North America from his native Germany, packed into a wooden crate filled with strudels, stolen, and marzipan just last year, arriving on our shores barely in time for the holidays. Upon disembarking from his cross sea voyage, He hid amongst the marzipan critters and made it safely, as the young delivery driver who picked him up delivered them all to a nearby bakery and pastry shop, which also sold a bit of candies and other confections on the side. Attempting to converse with his marzipan companions proved fruitless, and Teddy pursed his lips in his characteristic way, as his eyes bulged slightly in disapproval. And he then hopped away and out of that store, searching for more stimulating fraternity, others more suitable and appropriate to his station in life. His involuntary journey thus far had not disturbed him greatly. He was a tolerant and imperturbable amphibian, after all, and of high breeding, though not ignorant or unresponsive to the plight of the common frog. In general, frogs of all stations have this equanimity. As they are, in their own words, quote, alike on land and in water, end quote, meaning they can be comfortable in a variety of locations and situations, not to mention in widely diverse company. So Teddy, or Ribs as he liked to be called, but only close family tended to call him that, wandered a bit through the streets of Baltimore, all the while noticing. What most people might call a small lump caught in his throat, which seemed to be growing. He first noticed it while traveling in the crate, but hadn't paid it much attention at the time. He gagged and choked and then coughed, trying to dislodge it, but with no luck. A raven on a nearby telephone line overhead was watching Theodore throughout all of this, 
thinking he looked mighty tasty, though unsure what the darn frog's problem was, and then she thought better of eating him, considering her own delicate digestion, nothing to be toyed with, and certainly not worth risking on this paltry little green meal. Hardly a mo meal, even. More of an appetizer, really. But she flew down even so, out of curiosity, and she landed next to the unaware and pardoned appetizer, still gagging and hacking away on the side of the street. Ah, what seems to be the problem, little man? Cat got your tongue? Ah. Upon which she cackled with laughter and flapped her wings up and down in approval of her clever witticism. Theodore Ribbitz Kronprinz und Kaiser Berghoff von Waldschloss looked up at her with bulging eyes, made even more bulginer than usual from his coughing, and spoke thusly. I pray, dear raptor, or whate'er you be, he began, using his finest old and middle English, of which his father, Baron Kronprinz und Kaiser, Burghoff von Waldschloss, had taught him, being the only member of their family to have studied any foreign languages whatsoever, and having a predilection for classical studies. No, it be not a cat that havest my tongue, silly goose, or what e'er foul you be, but a <coughs> His speech having suddenly been taken over, most embarrassingly by that little glitch in his throat, and making him to sound a bit like a stepped-upon mouse, or a frog going through puberty. Upon which the raven crowed with laughter, wings of flapping wildly, and she retorted, Ach, I see. It be a frog in thee throat. Ach, she mocked him. Upon this comment, he turned bright red, but unfortunately for him, he really just turned a strange shade of brown, being the color a green frog actually turns when he blushes. He opened his wide mouth to make reply, hoping something witty might come to him. But to his chagrin, he could think of nothing in time, and instead he just stood there silently, with gaping wide mouth and bulging eyes. The raven leaned forward expectantly, waiting for his answer, her beak parting slightly as mirth rose up from her bosom, her gleaming eyes gleefully sparkling in the sunlight. But before her good humor erupted again from her belly at his expense, Teddy turned and hopped away in a flash, too stunned with embarrassment to withstand another moment of it. And certainly, were he a tadpole still, he would have retreated with tail between his legs. Oh, there are many other things that can be said about Theodore's journey, but for now, I will only tell the next important event about how he found his way to a people most like him in every way, among whom he settled and lived happily. Well, immediately after his embarrassing debacle, he made his retreat away from that boisterous raven. He discovered a local branch of the Baltimore Public Library, and so, being a fairly erudite and scholarly frog, he high-footed his way into the archives, where he discovered that a large community of Germanic tree frogs had emigrated many years earlier and had settled in the low country of southern Pennsylvania, in a wooded copse not far from Littlestown. With glee, he exclaimed joyfully at this discovery from his perch behind the microfiche machine, which had been unplugged and tucked on a small table behind the periodicals from the 1950s all which were waiting there to be discarded, if the custodian could ever get around to actually doing his job. The librarian heard what she thought was a mouse squeaking, but which was truly just our poor tiny Teddy with his unfortunate ailment, and so she called maintenance, asking them to set traps again for the upteenth time, and why don't they ever do what she asks them the first time? As they prepared to send someone over to set the traps, Teddy made his way out the back door, and began his trip to Littlestown to find his people. In fact, he even made it most of the way there before the custodian did finally make it over to the archive room to set the traps. First of all, he couldn't find them. Then he got hungry and had to have a snack. And after that, he got tired, and so he took a nap. Well, by the time he woke up again, it was time to go home for the day. The next morning, when he got to the library, he forgot. And it wasn't until sometime in the middle of the following week when the librarian heard the mouse again, and this time it really was a mouse and not ribs, 
Well, when she called the custodian again and asked why he never can do what she asks the first time, he got the message and finally set the traps. By the time the librarian checked on the traps and realized the custodian had forgotten to set them with any kind of food or bait in them, the mice had long since left the archive room and had resettled in the basement, where the custodian had left a garbage bag filled with leftovers from the break room refrigerator. He had honestly intended to take it out to the dumpster and throw it away, but as he was making his way to the back doors, well, he got the worst charley horse in his leg, and he had to return to the supply room, where he went to get something to put on it. Well, after that, it was about time to go home for the day. Meanwhile, in a small wooded area, not far from the Maryland-Pennsylvania border, a small community of immigrant German tree frogs just added a member to their numbers. Oh, and what a member indeed. One with aristocratic pedigree and a noble heritage, and a fine young bachelor with prospects, we might add. Yes, of course, you know who. Theodore Ribitz Kronprinz und Kaiser Burgraf von Waldschloss. And you'll be happy to know, well, the little glitch in his throat eventually took care of itself. No, the cat hadn't gotten his tongue, and it certainly wasn't a frog in his throat. Well, it turns out that Teddy is allergic to marzipan. Who knew? He had eaten some on the trip over from Europe and was just suffering a little anaphylactic episode, but nothing too serious. Well, he is a frog after all, and as they all like to say about themselves, quote, we're alike on land and in water, end quote, which is to say that they can be comfortable in all situations and nothing much really bothers them, at least not for very long. The end. <laughs>